Okay, so our paper uh, today is called Flickering Alchemy, Curating Noisy Transgenic and Broken Creatures. Following Deleuze, we're interested in how it is at the level of interference of many practices that things happen, beings, images, concepts, all kinds of events. This paper will articulate something of the interferences of education, academic and artistic practices as experimentations of movements and processes opening on to what Manning and Masumi describe as a commotion of relational activity, each vying to be written down to be the conduit of the field summing up in, an, in a determinate expression. Caught among the pulsations of such commotion, this presentation is defined by what our senses are compelled to attend to, as we find ourselves drawn to some images and a text. Untitled by Francesca Woodman. Mummy, do you like being human? No, not really, do you? No, I'd like to be something useful, like a door handle. The colour comes, then the shape, then the size. The whole thing needs time to get integrated. To be described as a door, there is a position, the open or closed. And then we would also show you Amanda Rebet's show. Yes. Oh, it's, it's shown already. And there's uh, Amanda Rebet's film called Entry um, that also plays into hopefully the presentation. Empirical materials, a photograph, some field notes, a quotation, and a film. We're struck by their imminent relationality, a background movement of affordances that somehow manoeuvre the image and text to the fore of the ongoing commotion. Unfolding in and onto each other, as Manning suggests, one artwork catches another in its movement of thought. They produce ideas of door handles and of wood, shadows and surfaces, fullness and flatness, voices and vibrations, edges, flows and intensities. Such movements of thought absorb our attention into the idea of door handle, arising from whilst remaining deeply entangled with the, within the splintering fibres that stray the flat surface of the door. The handle somehow modulates our experiencing, busying our bodies and creating sense, as Manning and Masumi would say. With consciousness flickering, we scavenge around the spaces evoked by the images and text, preparing to write about Alfred's imagining of himself as a door handle, as Manning and Masumi might propose, already tending towards expressions in, of use value. A door handle is an opening into another space, an escape, a solace, a place to hide. In its use value, the handleness almost disintegrates, its usefulness critically apparent to us. However, by encountering art as a Deleuzean occasion for experimentation, we resist door handle as a mere object of recognition. The expressions drawn to our attention by Mukhapa Day and Alfred are already interfering and experimenting with Woodman's photograph and Amanda Rivette's intimate doorway encounters. This paper will look at such processes of experimentation in relation to our own artful research writing practices, forcing thought via Deleuze's series of fundamental encounters between art and philosophy. We will play with molecular movements that conjure something of the intensive plane below bodily and rational organisation of qualitative early years research. Post a non-human term, challenging that which we thought we'd already rethought. Given that much of our time is spent mingling in the terrain of early years education, we are entangled inexplicably with modernity and enlightenment logic. Yet we've also been swept up by theories that have sought to erode the very foundations upon which contemporary early childhood education is founded. Such foundations are secured by salient discourses, including liberal humanism and rationality, which together mark the child out as a redemption figure. Our past and continuing emotions in post-structuralism, post-modernism and feminism seek to constantly erode bastions of enlightenment logic where linear narratives of growth and development are directed towards the organization and stratification of the body so that what is produced 
is a generalised standard and norm. As Deleuze and Guattari point out, you will be organised. You will be an organism. You will articulate your body. Otherwise, you're just depraved. You will be signifier and signified, interpreter and interpreted. Otherwise, you're just a deviant. You will be a subject, nailed down as one. Otherwise, you're just a trap. Fearful of depravity, deviance, and being a tramp, children are constantly encouraged to practice different forms of mastery, including regulated and regulating gender performances. And whilst we recognise that learning to be girl or boy might still seem like a reasonable expectation for some, we are also mindful that the very notion of reasonableness is understood as already tending towards expressions in use value, quickly able to be cross-checked and rendered into essence and fact. So the political project for us is that the category of human has been colonised by the white, middle-class, heterosexual, able-bodied male. And according to Carol Adams, Western culture has privileged the white man over the animalized woman and the dead animal. We live in a visual culture where image after image of women are depicted as food for men's consumption. A pig on the plate is like a prostitute on the street, ready to be consumed by a fork or by phallus. Nomadic writing movements, door, handle, shadows, and alchemy. This second section of the presentation develops our interest in research as nomadic, situating the research process in continuous flux, but always demanding disruption to that flux. Interestingly, Honorato suggests that the idea of a door seems to have its origin at the exact moment humans abandon nomadic life to inhabit more permanently a specific place. Our lingering around the concepts of door, door handle and doorway is about an assured usefulness, an assumed usefulness that simultaneously refuses to be pinned down. But as Deleuze forewarns, it is not enough simply to say concepts possess movement. You also have to construct intellectually mobile concepts. Writing in a constant state of in process necessitates movements including stirring up our own ontological and epistemological uncertainties. Taking up the space afforded by Francesca Woodman's image of the dislocated door, Amanda Rovette's film about a transitional space, and Alfred's words allow us to challenge the corrosive effects of habit. In our desires to see other worlds, we begin with ordinary things, a door, a doorway, a door handle. Yet when caught in Alfred's mouth, in the splintered wood of the doorframe in a back street of Dal Nepal in India, and in Woodman's dislocated image, something happens to these ordinary things. If we try to attend to sets of relations in and of ordinary things, door, doorway and door handle are no longer understood as determinable known objects. Rather, we contemplate doorness, doorwayness and door handleness as discrete qualities or what Deleuze and Guattari describe as an extraordinarily fine topology that relies not on points or objects, but rather on anxieties on sets of relations. Whilst doors might typically and habitually be understood as a threshold allowing passage, Woodman's image encourages us to defy habit. For us, Woodman's image is an in intensive space of affects. It is open-ended, non-linear, haptic, a nomadic space. It is full of latency, of hidden, implicit, reserved things. According to O'Sullivan, affects are then, to use uh, deluso Guattarian terms, the molecular beneath the molar, life's and art's intensive quality, as the stuff that goes on beneath, beyond, even parallel to signification, which in itself allows other planes of reality to be perceivable. Francesca Woodman's image communicates, yet with no immediate need for language. Deleuze might say it evokes a summoning and a making visible of forces, 
working on our bodies and minds as we in turn work on it. The image brings us towards what Deleuze describes as singularities, turning points and points of inflection, points of condensation, part of what constitutes the virtual proper being of things, their unique being, their thisness. The wood, the metal hinge, the forces, reflective light, contours and edges constitute fullness and shadows. The stilling of the door as door casts ghostly movements, hints at other narratives where dead air breathes uncanny forms of life. No longer functional, seemingly forgotten, this door escapes being a door, yet tilts at other possibilities. Its doorness is provocatively suggestive of becoming attentive to a field of immediacy rather than being with habit. Woodman's image is excessive, whereas a commotion of relational activities, it casts doubt on our typical, habitual, logical and reasonable ways of making sense, including making sense of a door. In turning back to Alfred's conversation with his mother, we find ourselves caught again in the thick of a brief and fleeting conversation. Just as the door, entrance, shadows, dust, light and air were fields of experience in Woodman's photograph, so too is Alfred. This field of experience similarly confounds us because it refuses to shake down into patterns of predictability. Door handle is put into commotion with human Alfred does not assume his Cartesian birthright of mastery. Instead, he offers an alternative relational way of thinking about himself, where he would like to be something useful, like a door handle. Alfred has tilted the world, where our perceptions of the normal state of things have been skewed. We wonder how our brief, other transdisciplinary research spaces Sorry, I'll read that again. We wonder how our brief tilted experimentations across Woodhead, Woodman's, Woodman's door and Alfred's handle can move us into other transdisciplinary research spaces. We want trans here to become a troubling, a troubling tool, a collection of tr noisy, transgender, empirical creatures that refuse the Cartesian mind, body, human, more than human, researcher, research divide, the aim being to counteract silences and sedation in educational research. Nomadic possibilities. As nomadic meddlers caught in the middle of things and still being drawn into art and experimentation that allows different stories around door, door handle and doorway to grow we turn to other excerpts of data that stem from some of our ethnographic work. So when collecting data in classrooms in the UK, we began to notice certain phrases that peppered adults' accounts of young children and their behaviours. Words such as feral and running wild were used. On another occasion, a girl was described as, she's just like sap, so slow, dreary. For us, they resonate with Deleuze and Tari's You're Just a Tramp, where the child, the system, and its organizations are out of kilter. Working in much the same way as Alfred's door handle, terms such as feral, running wild, and sap, are what Holmberg and Ireland describe as ordinary treasures, simultaneously ordinary stuff and treasured rarities. They stand out as boundary crawlers, elements that modulate our experiencing of the surface of events, interfering with our rush to document the usefulness of the proper tamed child. There are many ways into thinking about feral and sap. They cast interesting shadows over flattened surfaces. As nomadic devices, they break the purity of lineage, unsettling traditional codes, 
and destabilizing the subject as they, like the door, doorway, and door handle, cast dark and tantalizing shadows across the proper child, becoming spectral figures, tramps who pollute the natural order. From the commotion at the outset of this presentation, our agitation of ideas continues and is intensifying as we try to stay open to the chaotic, throbbing, more than human worlds we, found up, we find ourselves scrambling around. With moments coming in and out of focus that modulate our experiencing of the world, we are deliberately resisting the urge to clear ground, dispel commotion and eliminate our tormentors. We are paying closer attention to what Deleuze writes as, uh, sorry, to what Deleuze writes is neither seen nor understood, but is nevertheless perfectly present. The thicker the thread which links the seen set to other to other unseen sets, the better the outer field fulfills its function. The adding of space to space. The movements of feral and sap pull us back, while also compelling us forwards. We're trying to rethink data as words, but also as images, movements, politics, molecules, affect, noise, anxiety, and pollution. We wonder if our attention was located on just a door, or a handle, or indeed a child, would our thinking remain without shadows? If so, would the foreness and use value of the subject remain forever visible and fixed, rather than in movement and becoming imperceptible? The importance of researchers attending to the shadows cast by children, marked out as feral and like sap, is that they always render the subject persistent, but in ways that Deleuze and Guattari write are about reconstituting the nature of the perceptual field and changing the threshold of the perceivable world. The threshold of the flat, perceivable world of the proper child becomes fuller and noisier with such words. They exist here as written representations of what once were spoken words. They gesture towards images of a wild, animal-like child and an oozing, thick substance. They conjure wounds, insults, fear, denigration, but they also gesture to movement, energetic, unpredictable, and excruciatingly slow. We propose that feral and sap and the schooled concepts that lie behind them, such as not disciplined and without motivation, never pre-exist their movement, but as Manning might suggest, are always edging into themselves as object, shading into themselves as figure, as words and concepts. They are merely a brief constellation of what those movements have become. In the classroom, the movement evoked by, she's just like sap, refuses only to be tethered to its use value, but continues to work across the flat surfaces of the proper child. It modulates the adult's acute pull of gravity to insist on space-time conformity, whilst simultaneously gesturing at many tensions. The entangled vectors of time, space and intensities flow among the early years classroom and are suddenly forced into stark relief. The adults imaginary of a proper classroom, of a proper classroom speed is drawn and our striated apparatus of the state is marking out how particular functions secure the child's contribution to the success of the collaborative class. Amongst these classroom art gallery and Indian backstreet abrasions and skirmishes, we are struck by the call to pay attention to movements in the process of creating the human body. The movements of this language, this language form, cast shadows that refuse to find and resist the consolation of form, perhaps offering up greater stories as they compose with movements and flexions to stir something to access of themselves. We come to rest momentarily where we reconsider what further possibilities might be encountered 
if we continue to move within the forces of process ontology. For us, we find degrees of shadowy optimism in the nomadic movements that are materialised in fields of experiences that, that do not begin and end with the human subject. You're in perfect timing. It's 20 now. Oh, that's a good <laughs> It's a clockwork. <laughs> um, are there any questions? Please, yeah. Mark. Uh, just one question. Well, just maybe explain the video in the front. Uh, it's great to watch it while you were talking, but just a little background. Yeah, it's a video that uh, was made by um, a colleague of ours um, uh, who is a visual anthropologist. Um, and in some ways, we came across it um, accidentally. We didn't plan to incorporate that into the presentation. Yeah. And when we did actually write about it as well, it became far too long, so we decided just to play it. Yeah. Um, but for us, it was part of a kind of assemblage of provocations, really, around this idea of door and doorway. It worked really well. I mean, it had all the people enjoying dancing and portals and stuff. Yeah. And stuff and like, just, yeah. just to speed back to your presentation. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. And also, do you, are you early childhood educators who work in classrooms? Yes, we are. Yes, we're both professors of um, early childhood back in the UK. One of the problems, uh, well, actually, I'm working in Hong Kong with members, but one of the problems, um, as you well, probably might not be realised, is that the, um, this terrific um, conformity around yeah. what is normal, and um, you know, that seems to be getting tighter in terms of. Um, you know, what children are allowed to be, um, uh, you know, especially as it's kind of hooked to the humanism and to, to the whole sort of discourse of um, success and um, you know, doing well in tests and assessments and so on. So the backlash of that is that um, you know, in, in the classroom um, there are less spaces for children to be other. You know. mm. uh, so uh, we, we, you know, our work is, is located around doing very ordinary straightforward stuff but in doing the ordinary and straightforward stuff we're constantly falling over um, the data that, that positions the child as fair or as you know she's like as sap um, and for us uh, it's a matter of what can we do where can we turn in order to actually keep ourselves um, uh, in a state of Kind of tension around that, that, those things. You know, what can you do as as critical commentators to um, to not only work on your own mind in terms of resisting that logic that we're in, mm -hmm. uh, because we are in it. You know, um, but also maybe, uh, and we have done work with practitioners where we have used film to also get them to think about the consequences when children are seen in very in, in some particular ways and not in others. Oh, a normal question is, have you come across any sort of case studies that are, that are able to balance kind of like, a, a, like an ability to kind of maintain kind of a creative freedom in the development of a child, but also happen to be you know, able to function and in society like it's a effective, like, you know, kind of, there's like, there's, I guess there's that tension, like you can't be totally dark, uh, anarchic, but you don't want to, to, to cycle it, it really kills like yeah. their potential. I mean, in, in the UK, there is a school in Norfolk. Yes. Uh, called Summer Hill, which is based on Ace mm -hmm. Neal's um, philosophy um, of education. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, although it is a private, uh, it is a private school, um, their philosophy is very much kind of based on uh, seeing the child very differently and continually trying to disrupt how they view the child. And the children are very much part of. Uh, the management of the school, um, in fact they very often take charge when Ofsted inspectors go along, because Ofsted are the, the kind of governing body that inspects schools in the UK. Uh, well, I have to say, um, Rachel's work in Manchester itself is directly working with practitioners, um, where uh, she, I'm uh, talking for you. No, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's one of the, yeah, but what, one of the things about, uh, I will come back to, uh, to Curious, but one of the things about Summerhill, I think, is that um, 
a lot of the children, no, some of the children that leave come back and teach there. And there is a sense of um, your question about can they operate in the world, yeah. you know, how much are schools preparing children to operate and to conform in a world that, you know, where they do feel that they're operational. Um, and that's quite an interesting tension, I think. Um, you know, why do so many some Indians go back and teach there? But yeah, some, some of our current work in Manchester is, is trying to get practitioners to think. So we've got, at the moment in the UK, there's a, a government uh, mandate that, that's giving uh, disadvantaged two-year-olds a place 15 hours as a free place in nursery. Uh, so that they can play catch-up, cultural catch-up really, so that they can somehow be on a par with their wealthier peers right. um, by the time they reach school age. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do is to work with practitioners and think, okay, well, what does it mean to have a two-year-old in a school setting or in a nursery setting? How can we think about two-year-olds differently so they don't become institutionalised in a way that um, they so easily could if they came into a very kind of normative system? So we are trying to do lots of uh, interesting work, bringing practitioners from different places around Europe to, to disrupt some of that. There's one last question. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I have a question about, uh, you were uh, referring to, to children, but I, I'm just interested uh, what kind of age actually of children you had in mind while you were, like, or what kind, what kind of age group did you refer to? Because on the one hand, the age grouping in itself is super, um, it's the beginning of the certification. And uh, for example, the, I don't know if in UK there are any mixed age classes in the school or not. For example, in Russia, where I'm coming from, this is not the case. And this existed during the Soviet times in the countryside schools. And there it was some freedom actually. But uh, it doesn't exist. But still, there is a big difference, I think. Like, why do you think about that? like kids who are like in the kindergarten age or when they begin, just begin the school and when they go into more like towards the teenage age because there are different sets of desires there. Yes. And I think that what is kind of very interesting in a sense is not only pedagogy of the concepts or knowledge but also pedagogy of desires. Mm -hmm. What are you allowed to, to want? Mm -hmm. And like why do you want what you want and can you want something different? I mean, and this is bad it's not only for kids but for us as well. Yeah, really um, well, the children that we focus on, um, you know, as part of our, our sort of professional unit, uh, is our um, early years, which is anything up to about eight, eight years old. Children legally in England have to, in the UK, have to begin school at five. Uh, so the work that we've done, substantial amounts of work around things for that, that age group, and we've also progressively, because of this business where um, you know, the government in that sort of very rational way has mm -hmm. sort of said, if this two-year-old is not getting such good life chances, let's put them into school and that will solve the problem. You know, no, no attention to the poverty, of course, it's, it's the child becomes responsible for, as it were, you know, for, 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 for the work that he's doing. So, so that's the age group, but I think that's a really interesting idea about pedagogy, about pedagogy of desires and something that will, mm -hmm. will continue to think about. So.